All right, so good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, first PowerPoint lecture, uh, chapter 22 on your TMA books, uh, physical agents to promote tissue healing. All right, so physical agents <coughs> are used to promote tissue healing for patients with a disability as a result of injury, disease, or loss of a body part. Uh, physical agents function to improve circulation, provide support, promote the return of motion. So when we talk about agents, we're talking about treatments, we're talking about therapy, uh, walkers, canes, crutches, ice packs, cold packs, these things help with injury, they help with disease uh, and loss of a body part, amputation, prosthetics. So for us as an MA, we're going to be using physical agents used in the office, mainly heat and cold hot packs, cold packs, soaks, compresses, therapeutic ultrasound, which is ultrasound using uh, sound waves to deliver heat or cold, um, casts, splints, ambulatory aids, uh, such as a crutch, uh, canes, walkers. Um, so the application of heat and cold, we usually use that to treat infection and trauma. Um, so as an MA in the office, you need to inform our patient, teach them what we're doing, why we're doing it, and we're going to show them how to how to apply it, how to do it, how to apply compresses, how to apply hot packs and cold packs, how to use the crutches, how to adjust and fit the patient for a walker or for a cane. So we need to, uh, before we do all of that, uh, it's very important for us to understand the effects of heat and cold on the body. Uh, <clears throat> Conversely, too much heat and too much cold can be a bad thing. So we need to understand uh, the limits of the therapy that we are treating our patients with. So common applications, I do want you to uh, remember this, uh, dry heat and moist heat, and then dry cold and moist cold. And basically what's all that is saying is that dry heat is the delivering of heat without moisture. It's not wet. So we're using a heating pad or a chemical hot pack, these plastic bags that have two chemicals inside of them that are separated by a capsule and you crack open the inner capsule and then the chemical reaction and it creates heat or it creates cold but there's no wetness there's no water involved no moisture involved those are that's dry heat and dry cold moist heat moist cold those are hot soaks hot compresses uh, a hot and cold soak is when you immerse the body part into a bucket of water um, or you wrap a hand towel or a um, bath towel dip it in water and wrap that and use it as a compress and that's wet that's moist so those are your two differences uh, dry heat dry cold moist heat moist cold <clears throat> so these are applied uh, for short periods of time to produce the desired result most of the time it's 15 to 30 minutes uh, and you repeat as needed by the doctor. Uh, however, keeping the heat on for more than 30 minutes or keeping the cold on for more than 30 minutes can actually have an adverse effect. They're going to actually have the opposite reaction. So that's what I, what I was saying earlier. Too much heat or too much cold can actually make things worse. So the recommended time for heat or cold is usually 15 to 30 minutes, whether it be a compress or a pack dry heat or moist heat. So the kind of heat and the kind of cold, whether it's dry or whether it's moist, it all depends on what we're going to use it for. Is it used for inflammation? Is it used for swelling? Is it used for pain? Is it used for localizing the area, uh, the location and condition of the affected area, the age of the patient, and the general health of the patient? If a patient is really sick and has some secondary infections and other issues going on, you might not want to put on a hot or cold pack um, if they're old. Infants and older people have very, very thin, delicate skin, so a heat or cold can actually, uh, you can actually burn their skin if you put too much heat because they react, uh, they react much more quicker to uh, heat than we do, uh, healthy individuals. So all of these things uh, weigh in as factors on whether, you want to, whether or not you want to put heat or cold and what kind of heat and cold. <clears throat> so... A patient's heat cold receptors adjust to changes in temperature. This results in a decreased heat cold sensation. Temperature actually remains the same and it still provides therapeutic effects. So what happens is, um, as you will know, for, for, as an example, if 
we were to step into a sauna or a jacuzzi and the water is extremely hot and you get in and you just the water is almost burning uh, after 15 20 minutes your temperature sensors get used to that and it's no longer hot anymore in fact it's almost maybe lukewarm cold and you think wow you know it, the heat is gone let's turn up the heat uh, but what's actually happening is your receptors have adjusted to the change, but the heat is still there. The therapeutic effect of the hot water is still the same. So um, because your, your temperature sensors adjust to it, it no longer feels hot. So you think in your head, well, let's, let's increase the heat to make it hotter. And that's actually the exact opposite of what you would want to do because you could cause damage that way. So you have to be aware of that. The you know, heat and cold scepters adjust to changes, uh, but the temperature still stays the same. So yeah, like I said, they may want to increase the intensity because they don't perceive the same degree of temperature. It has, our body has gotten used to it. The water has not gotten any less hotter. It's just our bodies have gotten used to it and it seems like it's gone down, but it actually hasn't. So this can result in tissue damage very easily if uh, our patients are not too careful. So as I said earlier, this um, affects the factors that affect the application of heat and cold is the age of the patient. Uh, like I said earlier, young children, elderly patients are very, very sensitive to heat and to cold. And the location, certain areas of the body are more sensitive, um, chest, back, abdomen, broken skin. You don't want to be putting application of heat or cold over a broken area of skin. So these things are factors in determining where and if you want to apply uh, heat and cold. Impaired circulation. Uh, some people have circulation problems. Okay, so this would be like patients with peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, congestive heart failure. Their circulation is not as good, so their nerves are not as as good in detecting heat and cold. Impaired circulation, um, less nerves, they feel less. So you have to be very careful with that. You may actually have the water or the soak too hot, but they can't feel it because their uh, circulation is impaired. Uh, so you could actually burn them and they wouldn't know it because their circulation is impaired. So you have to be very sensitive to uh, the types of patients that you're going to be giving this treatment to. Some people uh, tolerate the change in temperature. Some people have impaired sensation. Uh, diabetic patients are extremely susceptible with the poor circulation. Uh, you have to be very careful. And I would assume as a good MA, you would already know ahead of time whether or not your patient is diabetic. And if they are, and the doctor wants you to put a cold compress on their lower leg or a hot compress, you're hopefully going to take that into account that my patient is diabetic. I don't want to start out too hot. And, you know, of course, 15 to 30 minutes and then you have to take it off. Um, these things, these are all factors that are going to help you determine whether or not you want to apply heat or cold to a specific area. So you want to look at the area before, during and after. So <clears throat> I want to look for signs that indicate a modification of temperature is needed. So prolonged erythema, which is essentially redness of the skin, paleness, pain, swelling, blisters. All of these are signs of damage, tissue damage, because the application is too hot or too cold. So I want to look at my patient's skin before I apply the heat. I want to apply it. I want to look at the skin while it's on. And after it's done, I want to look at it again before, during and after. I want to make sure the skin has a normal reaction to the heat and not an abnormal reaction to the heat or cold. So again, local effects of heat, 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, when you put something hot on the skin, it causes dilation. Now, dilation means your vessels get bigger. They dilate. They get larger. And that's just because of heat causes that to happen. It increases the blood vessels, increasing diameter. Uh, what happens is more blood flows to the area that's being heated. That's why you apply heat to certain areas because you want more blood to go to that area because among other things blood carries vitamins nutrients minerals but it also carries oxygen and oxygen helps with healing so if you have an area that needs to be healed you want to apply because of because of inflammation or bruising or strains or sprains 
uh, you apply heat. Blood goes to that area because the vessels get hot, they dilate, more blood flows in, and that's what you want. You want more blood to the area to help with the healing. That's basically what's happening. Um, it's called tissue metabolism. So the tissues begin to use up this energy and use up this heat, and the, the byproducts and all the poisons and toxins that are built up uh, get also taken away by the blood. So you want to increase the blood supply to an area. How do you do that? You warm up the area by applying heat. <clears throat> so among these things that uh, heat causes is erythema, which is, of course, erythema means reddening of the skin. And that only becomes red because the blood vessels, the tiny little blood vessels on the surface of the skin are much larger, much more blood. So it, the redness, that area is going to be redder because there's heat applied to it. So prolonged application. So if you've uh, usually, you know, like I said, the time is 15 to 30 minutes. Sometimes if you leave it on for more than an hour, then that causes the opposite effect. You know how heat causes dilation of the blood vessels. If you leave it on for too long, that causes constriction of the blood vessels. And the blood supply to that area decreases. So now the blood is no longer flowing to that area, which is not a good thing because we need that blood there for tissue metabolism and for healing. So you always want to apply the heat as specifically ordered by the doctor. If the doctor says, you know, hot compress to the right knee for 30 minutes, you do it for 30 minutes. You don't do it for 40 or 45. 30 minutes is what the doctor says, and that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, the purpose for applying heat is to relieve pain, congestion, muscle spasm, inflammation. Heat is often prescribed for low back pain, arthritis, menstrual cramps, localized abscesses, um, and the way heat works is it promotes muscle relaxation. <clears throat> if you have a muscle spasm, you have all these muscles that are just tight, tight, and heat allows, like I said, expansion, and it allows this contraction um, muscle fibers to relax and to go back to normal shape, and it will decrease edema. Edema is in the retention of fluid in the tissues resulting in swelling um, increased blood supply also increases the absorption of fluid from the tissues. So if you're suffering from edema, this extra fluid, in this extra fluid in your tissues, that increase of blood is going to help pull it away. And those tissues are going to get in, absorbed by the blood and drawn away from the area, and it's going to allow that area to come back to normal size. The decreasing edema is what its purpose for applying heat. Uh, it also works by softening exudates. So an exudate is a discharge pr produced by the body's tissues. Uh, exudate may form a hard crust and require a removal. So it, it basically it's like a big open scab. When that happens, you have a scab over an area that is a broken skin. You're going to have this scab that dries. And if you were to pull it off, you're going to tear the tissue and you're going to make it worse. As you all know, if you've ever pulled off a scab, it's dry, it's scaly, and you're going to pull it off, and you're going to create more damage than is actually good. So when you need to clean the area and you have a lot of exudates, you put a moist compress. You put a hot towel, a hot, wet towel over that area, and what that does is it moistens the exudate. It moistens the scab, and it allows you to brush it away. It allows you to pull it off without damaging the tissue underneath, and that's the whole idea of softening the exudates. Um, it increases suppuration. Now, suppuration, not separation, suppuration is the process of pus formation. Now, we all know that pus comes from broken wounds, broken skin. It, it basically, it's dead white cells and platelets. So if you have, uh, even if you don't have broken skin, say you have a, a, a giant cyst or a pimple or a boil underneath the skin, you have a white head or it's white and it's yellow, they got that pus underneath, that's a lot of pressure on your tissues. So by using the hot compress, that allows that separation to burst and to squeeze out all that pus and therefore relieve the pressure on the tissue. Um, so that will allow, it's going to help you with in the relief of inflammation, basically, is what heat is applied for, the main purpose. <clears throat> Not recommended for the initial treatment of acute inflammation or trauma. So when somebody has an injury, an acute injury, you don't necessarily want to put hot compresses on it. You want to allow that inflammation to happen first, the first stage of inflammation. You want that to happen 
Um, afterwards, of course, you can apply heat, but not at the moment of acute inflammation or trauma. Um, all right, so one of these agents that we use is a heating pad. It converts electrical energy into heat. Uh, you must not crush the wires or damage the pad because it can result in overheating and you could burn the patient with the heating pad. Um, be very careful with those. We always push, we always used to put a towel or a pillowcase over the heating pads when we use them on the patients. Uh, you don't want to secure them with pins because the metal pins can actually poke through the heating pad and maybe even short one of the wires and come in contact with the electrical wire and that could cause a shock. So that's that's a no-no. And we don't want to use these areas over um, that contain moisture because again, electrical current, moisture, not a good combination. That could cause an electrical hazard. So if you're going to use heat alongside a heating pad, you want to make sure it's a dry heat, not a moist heat. All right, heart soak is direct immersion of a body part in water and a medicated solution. Usually it's iodine, povidone iodine maybe a bottle of that in with a in the you know those pink tubs that they have at the hospital where you can put your hand in or put your foot inside of it um, that's what it means direct immersion you put your whole body part into the water and it's nice and warm and it's medicated you put some iodine in there to help with the infection maybe some peroxide um, so it's a medicated solution that's a hot soak and it's used to clean open wounds it's used to increase the separation it's used to increase the blood supply. Remember, if you're increasing blood supply to an area, you're increasing, you are making the healing process work faster. And also to apply a medicated solution to an area. Hot compress is just a washcloth. That's all it is, a soft, absorbent, moist washcloth immersed in a warm solution and applied to a body part. That's all it is. You just wet a towel and put it on the body part. We don't do those that often because one, it, it increases the use of linen, and two, they're wet, they're messy. You know, if you get your patient's clothes all wet and you know they're at work and they come by for the doctor's appointment on their lunch hour, put a hot compress on their hip or their knee and their pants are all wet, we always, most of the time they use compresses, um, I'm sorry, most of the time they use chemical packs, dry heat, uh, rather than hot compresses. They still do them, but it's very rare, really, to be honest with you. Um, it's the same reason that we put a compress on the foot or soak. It's to increase the separation, increase circulation, soften exudates if there are any. All right, chemical hot pack, same exact thing that's going on with moist heat, only there's no moisture involved. It just has a, it's a chemical reaction that, in, that happens inside this plastic bag, and it only works. It only works for about 30 to 60 minutes, uh, sometimes not even that much. But still, remember, remember the 15 to 30 minute rule. You don't want to have a chemical hot pack on longer than 30 minutes anyway, unless specified by the physician. Uh, we always want to keep it at 30, 30 minute maximum. Um, these are, you could store at room temperature. You don't have to put them in a special area. And it's just, uh, you would want to use a chemical hot pack rather than the heating pad because you can use them to relieve pain you can use them to relieve muscle spasms <clears throat> and they're portable all right so cold uh the local effects of cold again 15 to 30 minutes the constriction of blood vessels results in a decreased blood supply to the area tissue metabolism decreases less oxygen is used fewer ways to accumulate skin in the area becomes cool and pale so if you notice I'm talking about decreased blood supply, decreased metabolism, less oxygen. It's all the exact opposite effects of what happens when you apply heat. When you apply heat, remember, it causes erythema, redness, increased blood supply, increased tissue metabolism, increased oxygen, uh, and the removal of more wastes. However, cold does the opposite. Cold decreases the blood supply decreases tissue metabolism and, and it decreases the amount of wastes that can be pulled away from the tissue. So it's, it's the exact opposite of heat. And the area will itself become very cool and pale, uh, maybe even a little bluish if too much cold is put on for too long. But for the most part, we get a paleness to the skin because those vessels are constricting due to the cold. So all that blood that's at the surface of the skin gets pulled away and hides deep down in the tissue, so it leaves the skin color uh, pretty white and pale. 
So prolonged application, again, you leave the cold on for too long, just as much as if you leave the hot for too long, it produces reverse secondary effects. And in this case, the blood vessels would dilate, which means they're going to get larger and the tissue metabolism is going to go up. It's just exactly the opposite of what happens when you use heat. Just think about that. The exact opposite of what happens when you use heat is what happens when you use cold. So the purpose of applying cold is prevents edema if applied immediately after a patient has suffered a direct trauma, like a bruise, a minor burn, a joint injury, fracture, sprain, uh, sprain, trauma to a joint that causes injury to the ligaments, or a strain, which is an overstretching of a muscle caused by trauma. So during, during moments of trauma, immediately trauma, you do not want to put on heat, as I mentioned earlier. We do want to apply cold. Cold reverses edema. It, it doesn't allow the tissues to swell up because remember, tissue comes in contact with cold water, they shrink, they, they constrict, not dilate, they constrict. Um, so joint injury, fractures, sprains, these kinds of things, you want to apply cold right away. That's going to cause constriction and it's going to, it's going to reduce the amount of swelling, in other words, and you want to do that right away as it happens. So the purpose of applying cold is to limit the accumulation of fluid in the tissues by the constricting blood vessels. So the, again, the tissues do not have a time, they do not have a time uh, to swell up, to become inflamed because of the cold. It's constricting the blood vessels and it's reducing the leakage of fluid into the tissues and it controls bleeding. So if you're going to be bleeding out something really fast, really bad bleeding, you're going to apply something cold, it's going to cause those blood vessels to constrict and they're going to shut down and it's going to basically help stop the blood flow. Uh, cold also temporarily relieves pain due to the numbing effect. It reduces the stimulation to pain receptors. It reduces inflammation. Uh, you always want to place a cold application in a protective covering. You don't want to put a chemical cold pack right on the bare skin because you could actually cause a burn, a cold burn. Uh, so you want to wrap it up with a paper towel or wrap it up with a, a hand towel before you apply it to the body part. <clears throat> All right. Ice bags. This is a waterproof bag with a screw-on cap. It must be filled with small pieces of ice to mold to the body better. So there's the thing. If we use ice, we can use ice, but we don't want to use the big chunks because the big chunks take up a lot of space. And you fill up this bag with big chunks of ice and it doesn't exactly fit very well over the knee or over the arm or the shoulder. It doesn't, doesn't mold around the body part because it's got these big clunky ice chips. And there's airspace in between the ice. So if you have small pieces, little chips, small chopped up ice, those small pieces could form over the body parts and it um, limits, it reduces the amount of air in between the ice. So you can apply more ice with a smaller bag and the smaller ice is going to shape the body part much better. So that's you know one, one reason that we want to keep that on there. Cold compress is just, it's just a wet hand towel. Soft, moist, absorbent cloth immersed in a cold solution. Uh, what we used to do in ICU is I would have put it a 50-50 solution of rubbing alcohol and water. And rubbing alcohol uh, makes the water uh, super cold. It's as if you had ice in it, but there's no ice. You just put some alcohol in there and it just, I guess the air interacts with the alcohol and cools that compress even more. It makes it even more colder. And then you apply it to the body part. Uh, again, cold compress, it's wet. It's going to get everything wet, the patient wet, the bed, the clothing. So, you know, if the doctor wants a cold compress, you go with a cold compress. But uh, like I said, other times, most of the time these days, we go with chemical cold packs, dry cold. And of course, it's used to relieve pain, relieve inflammation, treat certain conditions, the headache, eye injury, pain from a tooth, uh, tooth extraction. Uh, these are the things that we want to use as a tooth extraction for reducing uh, inflammation and pain, helping with the pain. Okay, so I'm gonna stop right here uh, so I can record this and I'm gonna break the 
presentation into parts so it'll be small enough a file that I can send to you on email. So we're going to stop right here and then continue on with uh, this next slide. Uh, it will be slide 38 of 76. So we will continue in a few minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, so let's continue with uh, chemical cold pack. Um, we want to use, again, this is a dry cold, not a moist cold. We use it as an alternative to an ice bag to prevent swelling, control bleeding, relieve pain, relieve inflammation. Okay, so you want to use cold for inflammation, for relieving pain, as opposed to using heat. Heat would not be used to relieve pain. Heat would not be used to control uh, inflammation. Again, you have to remember the effects of heat and cold on the body. Heat expands, increases blood flow, Cold decreases blood flow, shrinks down the blood vessels. So ambulatory aids. All right, let's talk about <clears throat> tools and equipment that people need to help uh, as an aid in ambulation. Now, ambulation means to walk, to be able to walk. When somebody, when a patient is ambulatory, it means that they can walk. Non-ambulatory means they cannot walk. Uh, then you also have words such as weight-bearing, partial weight-bearing, non-weight-bearing. Weight-bearing means you can, you can stand up, you can stand on your foot, you can support your weight with your legs. Uh, partial weight-bearing would be having to, if you have a broken foot, a broken right foot, and you're standing on your left foot, so you're partial, partial ambulatory, partial weight-bearing. You can't put weight on both feet only one and then you have non-weight bearing which you cannot put weight on any on either feet of course you know you're going to be in bed or you're going to be in the wheelchair most of the time so uh, these are terms that i want you to become familiar with um, ambulation of course means walking or moving ambulatory means you're able to walk or move from one place to another so these aids that uh, help us in ambulation for our patients help our patients become ambulatory uh, as cranes, canes, I'm sorry, canes, crutches, and walkers. Um, with what kind of equipment we use? Do we use a cane? Do we use a walker? Do we use a wheelchair? Do we use a crutch? That depends on the type and severity of the disability, uh, the amount of support required. Okay, amount of amount of support meaning is this patient total weight bearing, non weight bearing, partial weight bearing. It depends. And the patient's age and degree of muscular coordination. Uh, I would say very young children and very old people fall under this category. Um, the older you get, the less sense of balance you have, the less muscle coordination, your reflexes. If you are older and well, me, for example, or, or anybody who's you know healthy, you fall forward or you fall back, you put your hands up. You put your hands forward. It's a reflexive action. As you get older, those reflexes go away. You cannot support yourself. So when you fall, when an older patient is beginning to fall, they're not able to put their hands up. They literally fall on their face and then they put their hands. It's just the reflexes, they go away. Muscular coordination doesn't work. They trip very easily. So I'm gonna be assessing my patient. Can my patient even walk? Should they be using a walker instead of a cane? <clears throat> Uh, maybe a walker might be better because the patient is very unstable, very uneasy. They get dizzy very easily. Cane is not going to help that much. If you use a four-point walker, that's the kind you want to use. Uh, if a patient is doing well, a little unsteady, but they can get along pretty good, maybe they can use a cane. So it depends. It depends on the severity of the disability and the age of our patient as well. So these ambulatory aids, these canes, crutches, walkers, these are temporary conditions. It's, you know, um, it's most of the time we use them for fractures. Crutches are used for fractures. A sprain to a lower extremity, you, you twist your ankle, you sprain your ankle, you're going to be partial weight bearing. So you're going to need some crutches. Or you might need a walker to help you get around. Uh, disability following an orthopedic surgery. So you have a knee replaced or you have um, surgery for your toes or your ankles. You're going to be off your feet for a while. Um, so they may have, they may prescribe you to use some crutches or walker during that time. It's a temporary condition. 
Long-term condition, that would be for people who are going to use crutches from here on out, or walkers, or a cane. Uh, that would be paralysis, of course. Uh, deformity, if a patient has um, scoliosis, the spine is S-shaped. Uh, the patient has a club foot. The foot is not shaped properly, so it, it turns inward. You cannot put any weight on it. Uh, permanent weakness of the extremer, uh, lower extremities, that could be from hemiplegia. Uh, paralysis, or another uh, medical condition called cauda equina, which results in loss of movement and ability to move your feet. Uh, so these are long-term conditions that, that patients are going to be using walkers or canes or even wheelchairs for you know pretty much the rest of their life. It's a long-term condition, as opposed to temporary, like a fracture or a sprain. Crutches, uh, these are artificial support made of wood or aluminum. They provide assistance in walking for patients with problems with lower extremities, such as a disease, injury, birth defect, and it helps you take the weight off of the legs and transfer it to the arms. Axillary crutch is used most frequently. Uh, it consists of shoulder rest and hand grips, extends from the ground almost to the patient's axilla, which if you remember, axilla means armpit. Uh, the rubber tips prevent crutches from slipping on the floor, and they're made of wood or tubular aluminum. Uh, I would say 99% of the crutches made these days are aluminum. They're not made of wood anymore. And again, I'm going to be explaining the crutches and the canes and the walkers and stuff, but it really doesn't do justice uh, doing a video lecture. So hopefully when we get back to normal, we can get back into the classroom. I will be able, be able to do hands-on type stuff with walkers, crutches, and canes. All right. Uh, so the other type of crutch that we have is called a forearm crutch or a Lofstrand. Uh, it is aluminum and it extends to the forearm. And it's a metal cuff that's attached to the arm here. And then the tube goes down and there's a grip that they hold on to. And then the cane goes down to the rest of the floor. Uh, a lot of people who have cerebral palsy have these kinds of canes um, or crutches. They're not axillary crutches. They extend from the forearm out. So you can see that they have a, a cuff that attaches to a bar and then the bar goes for a handle grip and then it goes down to the floor. There's a hinge right here so that the crutch can dangle off their forearm so that they can, you know, they can use it to walk and then they can just let go of the grip and then they can reach up and grab things off the shelf and then put, the, put your hands back in the grip. So a lot of people who have cerebral palsy uh, use these types of uh, crutches. They're called forearm crutches as opposed to axillary crutches. <clears throat> so for axillary crutches, you want to make sure that the measurement is properly fitted because if you're, if you're using the crutches up here and they're too high, they're going to put an enormous amount of pressure on your axillary nerve here. Uh, and it could cause shoulder pain, back pain, nerve damage, injury to your armpit. And most, what more importantly, most importantly, is it, it pinches the nerve here in the axilla. And that nerve deadens the rest of the arm. And you lose mobility in your hands. And that's called crutch palsy. Uh, when the crutches are too high, they're too long, and your shoulders are coming up, and you're hanging on this, and you're putting way too much weight on the inside of your armpit, pinches on your nerve, that creates crutch palsy. That's a, a result of an improperly adjusted crutch. So again, the crutches that are too long, it forces the shoulders forward and it creates crutch palsy. Um, if they're too short, again, you're gonna be hanging over, you're gonna be leaning over and you're gonna, it's gonna look very uncomfortable and they're gonna be awkward to use. Uh, a lot of times it's going to be so awkward that a patient might not even use them because, you know, they have to bend down to use them because they're too short, because nobody properly fitted them. So you have to be able to fit the crutches properly so that the patient is able to use them and will use them once they get home. So the top of the crutch, the shoulder pad, axillary pad, the very top of the crutch fits underneath the axilla there has to be at least two fingers distance between the top of the shoulder or I'm sorry the top of the crutch and the top of the axilla the bottom of the axilla right here 
your armpit and then two fingers width and then the shoulder crutch of the the shoulder handle of the crutch um, again you don't want your hand okay the two fingers have to be inserted between the top of the crutch and the axilla <coughs> the second part of the crutch involves the hand grips which are down below uh, again you have to have those adjusted correctly because if they are too low or too high again you're going to have a patient who is arms are hunched up because they're too high or they're down low because they're too low okay so hand grips that are too high or too low they need to be adjusted as well so they need to be adjusted at the top of the crutch and at the hand grip area Wooden crutches we're going to skip over because we don't even do them anymore. Aluminum crutches they are have uh, consist of spring loaded push buttons on the inner tube. So again, all of this stuff we're going to go over uh, when we see each other because <laughs> that's the best way to to explain and to describe and to demonstrate crutches is to do them hands on. So we will get to this point uh, hopefully uh, together soon. Okay. The MA, you are responsible for instructing the patient. You want to make sure that the patient is wearing well, uh, good, well-fitting shoes, not flip-flops or high-heeled sandals or anything like that, because you want to provide good traction and provide stability. You don't want your patient to be off balance. You need to use the correct posture to prevent strain on the muscles and joints to maintain proper balance. Again, putting too much weight, letting the axilla get pinched uh, creates crutch palsy so you want to you want to do that you want to make sure that they're not putting too much weight on the axillary pad uh, when a patient is walking you want to make sure that they look ahead that they're looking straight ahead that they're not looking down at their feet when they're walking because if they're walking and they're using their crutches and they're looking down they're not watching where they're going and they're going to fall or they're going to bump into something so you want to teach them to take small steps little baby steps no more than 12 or 15 inches and with each step uh, as they get better and more proficient at it they can take longer strides but we want to keep them at 12 to 15 inches um, if your patient is using them after you've given instructions for your patient uh, they go home and you want them to report any tingling or numbness in the upper body again we're talking about the axillary nerve being pinched and that will cause tingling or numbness in the shoulders, arms, and the hands, and the fingers. Um, obviously, if that's happening, then the um, either they're not using it correctly, or uh, the crutches were not fitted properly. So, which is very important. I, I also want to add that when we give instructions to our patients, when we show them how to adjust, the, when we adjust the crutches for them, we want them to demonstrate for us their ability to use the crutches in the medical office. We want them to walk down the hallway, come back, turn around, sit down, get back up. You want to make sure that they can do all of these things uh, before you let them go. And you want to look at their gait. You want to see how they're using the crutches. Are they using them wrong? Are they squeezing too hard? Is it pinching against their axilla? Um, all of these things you're going to take into account as they are doing it because you, that's what you want. You want a demonstration that they can do it before you let them Extra padding, you might be able to add extra padding to the shoulder rest, although I wouldn't recommend it because that kind of throws off your balance on the crutches. Um, you just want to make sure that the padding on the top of the crutches is good quality foam rubber. Now you can add maybe a little tiny bit to it, but I wouldn't go too far as to make them big and huge because, again, you're putting too much pressure on the axilla if you do that. <clears throat> so crutch gait. Uh, gait in itself means the way people walk uh, do they walk one foot in front of them? of course one foot in front of the other but do they limp do they favor one foot to the other side do their hips kind of shift a little bit as they're walking that is the type of gait that someone has uh, some people some patients have one foot that might be one inch or so shorter than the other that's going to change the way they walk so when they're walking they're not walking this way they have a little bit of a little bit of a limp to it that's your gait and the type of gait that a patient has it changes when they use crutches it's called a crutch gait so with the way they're walking changes as soon as they start using crutches so we want to make sure that the crutch gait uh, does not cause them any discomfort does not cause them any possibility of 
being off balance. We're also looking at physical condition of the patient. Okay, This patient may be way too large, way too obese to use crutches, can't support their body weight. Maybe that's not something, maybe that, maybe crutches are not going to be such a good idea after all. So patient's muscular coordination as well. Again, we're talking about older patients whose muscular coordination is not as good. Their reflexes are gone. Uh, we want to make sure that their coordination is good. Some people, and speaking of muscular coordination, we want to make sure that patients can walk normally. Some people can't, you know, coordinate themselves right. Um, it's like doing jumping jacks. Some people get them all backwards. They can't, their, their muscular coordination is off. They can't do it. So walking might be bad enough for them, but now you throw in a pair of crutches and they have to use the crutches at the same time that they're using their feet and they can't be at the symmetry. They ha you have to make sure that the patient is muscular, uh, is coordinated enough to even use crutches. So we have uh, two different types of crutch gates. A uh, fast gait and a slow gait. A uh, slow gait is basically little baby steps. Well, you can't take long strides in crowded areas because your crutches are going to hit other people and you're going to get twisted up and fall. Uh, if this, if the uh, area in front of you is open, <clears throat> you can move a little faster. You can use a fast gait. So we want to demonstrate to them a fast gait and a slow gait. Again, this all depends on the patient's muscular coordination as well. And we have four-point gait, <clears throat> the most stable, the slowest, and the safest gait. Uh, they call it four-point because there's literally four points of contact on the floor. It'd be your right leg, your left leg, the right crutch, the left crutch. Those four points, one, two, three, four. These are for people who have uh, can use both legs, but they're not able to support their own body weight. So they can walk. They can walk. Uh, but they have poor muscle coordination, poor balance, so they need something to help them. More than a cane, so they're going to use crutches. So four points. They're going to have four points of contact on the floor, which would be the right and left foot and the right and left crutch. And there's four points of contact on the foot on the uh, floor. A two-point is similar to, but it's faster than the four-point. So this is when you have only two points supporting the body at one time. So patients must have a partial weight bearing on each foot. They So they could put a little bit of weight on every foot, but not a lot. So this is what we call partial weight bearing. Uh, but most of the contact, most of the weight is going to be borne on the two crutches. So that's why it's called a two-point gait. And then you have a three-point, which is when a patient cannot bear weight on one leg. So this is almost always uh, dealing with a fracture or a knee surgery or an ankle surgery when um, it's partial weight bearing. So one foot is on the floor, the other foot is raised up. You just pull your knee up and you keep that foot off the floor. So on a three-point gait, the foot that is affected is always up in the air, never to come in contact with the floor. So you have the opposite foot plus the two crutches that gives you three points that are going to be in contact on the floor. So that's why it's called a three-point gait. Um, Three points, two crutches and one foot. That's the three-point gait. That is the most common um, gait that is used for crutches is the three-point gait. So these are used by patients, of course, who have an acute leg inflammation, recent leg surgery, amputees. You lost one leg and you haven't got your prosthesis yet. You're going to use a three-point gait. Uh, swing gait. So this is... Again, this is something that I cannot even begin to describe to you um, unless we do it in the class. So this is one of those things that I'm going to show you once we get into the lab. Canes. Canes are lightweight, easily movable device made of wood or aluminum with rubber tips. Provides balance and support. Very easy. Uh, used by patients who have weaknesses on one side of the body. Hemiparesis. Hemi means half, okay? H-E-M-Y, hemi means half. Paresis means paralysis. So if you have hemiparalysis, hemiparesis, what I'm really saying is half paralysis. So one side of the body. Patients who have had strokes, they lose mobility on one side of the body, whether it's the left or the right. 
joint disabilities, um, um, first thing that comes to mind is arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, defects of the neuromuscular system, such as Parkinson's or muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, these kinds of things, they are not exactly able to balance very good. So they need help with staying in balance. They don't exactly need a walker. They don't exactly need a crutch. A cane would, would, a cane would help them. So you have a standard cane that provides the least amount of support. And then you have, of course, tripod and quad canes. So these are single leg canes, but at the bottom, they usually have like a little tripod that can binds them with either three or four legs. It's easier to hold, gives them greater stability. The disadvantage with tripod and quad, quad, quad canes is that uh, they're bulkier and more difficult to move. They're, they're kind of, you know, they're kind of hard. They're kind of heavy, kind of bulky, kind of awkward. <clears throat> so when you're using the cane, now this is a um, popular misconception. You hold the cane on the side of the body opposite to the side that needs support. So a lot of people think if you have a right knee injury, you put the cane on the right knee side. That is wrong. You put the cane on the left side. So again, this is one of those things that I cannot show you or explain unless we're doing it face to face in the laboratory. So, you know, we're going to go over this when we see each other. But just remember that you hold the cane on the side of the body opposite to the side that needs support. Walkers, I think we all know what walkers are. They're aluminum frames with hand grips and four widely placed uh, legs open on one side. Uh, the advantage to this, it's lightweight and easily removable. Um, they fold up so you can put them in the car and make them easy to transport. Uh, patients like them a lot. Um, they are very easy to work with and they are adjustable. Again, we're going to, in the lab, practice with these, adjust them. So the walker should extend from the ground to the level of the patient's hip joint. So a patient standing at this plane, having them stand up, you're going to measure the hand grips for the walker to be right at the hip level. And these crutches, these walkers are much more uh, therapeutic and much more helpful with geriatric patients or older patients who have weakness or balance problems. Um, and also for temporary things like a knee or hip joint replacements. So this, these walkers, they provide the greatest amount of stability. Uh, the disadvantage is it's a slow, slow pace and it's difficult to maneuver in small rooms. So again, uh, when we see each other, when we see each other, uh, we will be able to go over all these things, the crutches, the canes, the walkers, and demonstrate them and try them out on each other and give you a much better idea of what's going on and how to use them. So hopefully uh, we will be getting back to normal soon uh, and until then uh, i will make another video on another powerpoint as soon as i can so until then take care and i will see you soon bye bye